Hello and welcome to this edition of Video Version Sunday School. Thanks for tuning in. As you have probably noticed, you can go back and replay past lessons if you missed one or want to simply review a passage. Our church's YouTube channel provides a simple way to do this. Also, encourage your family and relatives to visit our YouTube channel, not only for Sunday School lessons for children and adults, but also our recent services. It's hard to believe we're coming to the end of this quarter's lessons. We will be giving instruction soon on how you can get your new literature. Please join me in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this day and we're thankful for this opportunity to be together with you as we look into your word. I pray, God, that you would open your word to us Teach us the things we need to learn today, and we pray and ask these things in your name. Amen. And now to our lesson. Welcome to our study of the Word of God in this week's Sunday School lesson for May the 24th as we continue progressing toward the new normal of life, even as we look forward with great anticipation to the day when we can all be back in church again. I'm Jim Glass, one of the teachers in Al Harris's Pears and Spares class. And I have the privilege of leading you in today's lesson from the 14th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. In chapter 14, we're continuing our study of what the authentic Christian life looks like. Back in chapter 12, Paul made that significant transition from talking about why the righteous person lives by faith to how the righteous person lives by faith. And it all begins with offering yourself to God as a living sacrifice and allowing the Holy Spirit to renew your mind so that you can understand and prove what God's will is in your life. And we say that everything about the believer's life should be about worship, about bringing to God the reasonable worship that he finds acceptable. And it all happens in a lifestyle that's not limited to what we might do at church on Sundays. Since the last five chapters of Romans talks about how the righteous person lives by faith, we've called it a textbook of Christian ethics. And that's true of our text today. Flowing from Paul's instruction in chapter 12 that we live a life that properly reflects our gratitude to God for His manifold mercies, he explained in chapter 13 how we should regard those whom God has placed in positions a political authority over us, and how we should treat other people in general. Now in chapter 14, he narrows his focus to tell us how we should relate to our brothers and sisters within the church when it comes to individual matters of conscience, those things that one believer might think is very important, while another believer doesn't think it's so important. Paul's fundamental principle here is that such things are in themselves indifferent, but each person must be fully convinced in his own conscience that he or she is doing right. So here's the situation. In Paul's day, many of the followers of Christ who had lived in Rome were Jews who had committed their lives to Christ. Some of those Jews still held firmly to the practices and beliefs they grew up with or came to hold as particularly important to their faith, while others didn't think those things were necessary or even important at all. On the other hand, there were other believers within the church. They could have been Gentile converts or Jewish converts who still placed a lot of importance on certain days they regarded as deserving of special attention or worship. And some thought that everybody else should have the same reverence for these special days that, that they did. In contrast to this group were those who didn't share their appreciation for those days at all. So once again, the disagreement between these two groups led to some hard feelings between them. Paul's instructions to the believers in Rome cover these two situations, but you can be sure that he intended for the principles he set forth to be applied to other situations as well, with the foundation for these guidelines to be the life of faith that the righteous person lives demonstrated in the genuine love that he talked about back in chapter 12. First, about the food issue. This is what Paul says in chapter 14, beginning in the first verse. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions 
or as some older translations have it, scruples. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now in the church in Rome, there were followers of Jesus Christ, those who had truly and completely placed their trust in what Jesus has done to save them from their sins and present them blameless before God, who were, as Paul says, weak in their faith. Even though they believed and understood Paul's primary message of this letter, that the righteous person lives by faith alone, there was still a heartfelt need to reinforce their right living by following certain rules that they truly thought were necessary. The weakness of their faith didn't allow them to experience the full benefits of their freedom in Christ. So it was this confusion about what was really important that made them weak. Now please note, first of all, that Paul does not criticize them for their weak faith. He doesn't point out who they were. He doesn't complain that they're weak. He doesn't accuse them of lacking faith. And he doesn't shame them for where they were in their walk of faith. He simply recognizes, as all of them should have, that there were some who were weak in their faith and that they should be treated with loving acceptance. Part of their weakness was that they had not yet fully understood how their faith has freed them from the law of sin and death that he talked about in chapter 8 and freed them to live the abundant life that Jesus came to give and the resulting peace that we have with God that we talked about back in chapter 5. Some of those believers had generations of those before them who held certain beliefs and who made sure their children and grandchildren passed those same beliefs on to their children and grandchildren as well. And you probably know from your own experience something you learned from a mother, father, grandmother, or grandfather that is part of, of who you are, part of your family's heritage that you feel must be passed on to future generations. And so it was with these weaker brothers and sisters. And perhaps you can recall from your own experience the learning process that you went through when you first came to Christ. There were old habits to put aside. There was a new language to learn. There were old relationships that you had to give up. There was a new way of life that you wanted to follow. For some, that growth process is slower than for others. And Paul wants us to recognize that and show patience, kindness, and love to those who aren't where we are yet. How are we to treat these weaker believers? Paul says, those who are stronger in their faith, those who have a better understanding of the freedom we have in Christ, are to accept the weaker without passing judgment on them in regards to things that aren't central to our faith. What could happen if you were to embarrass or humiliate or publicly criticize a weaker believer? You may have seen it in yourself. Since their faith is weak and they look to you as a more mature, stronger believer, you could easily crush their spirit like crushing a fragile flower in your hand. You could make them angry. And instead of correcting their misunderstanding and leading them to a stronger faith, your, criticize, your criticism will only make them hold more strongly to their error. So, Paul says, accept him. Paul's not telling us to accept his weak belief or mistaken opinions, but you do need to accept your weaker brother or sister. The word we have translated accept means to aggressively receive with strong personal interest. In other words, we're to take weaker believers under our wings, to welcome them as members of God's family, and to invest our lives in their own spiritual growth. In the next chapter, chapter 15 and verse 7, Paul uses the same word when he says, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. So Jesus is our example when it comes to receiving or accepting those who are weaker in their faith. Positively, we take them under our wings. Negatively, 
We don't pass judgment on disputable matters or opinions or scruples, as your translations may read. So what are these disputable matters? Well, that's a great question and not one that has an easy answer. In general, disputable matters are those issues of faith and practice that do not contribute to our salvation. In his letter to the believers in Galatia, Paul spent a lot of time discussing those things that some Galatians believed were absolutely essential in order for them to gain salvation, but were not. And Paul dealt with them with a very heavy hand, as he should have. Here, though, and in 1 Corinthians, where there was an apparent agreement on the fact that we are justified by faith alone, Paul addresses those things that some thought every believer ought to do or not to do in love and understanding, and urges the other members of the churches to do the same. Does eating or not eating meat justify us before God? No. Does observing or not observing a certain day bring us good credit that we can apply to our balance sheet when we stand before God? No, because that's not how salvation works. It's a gift of God, not of works. The works come after our salvation to show how God has changed our lives. And, and there's so much we could say here. The two words that you have translated as disputable matters, opinions, or scruples in your Bible literally means something like judgments on reasonings. Paul understands that the weaker believers are wrestling with something in their minds. There's doubt and uncertainty. They may not have enough information to finally decide, or their willingness to trust God in this matter isn't strong enough yet. So they're caught between two positions that seem to be equally right and good in their minds. For example, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another person whose faith is weaker feels that he can only eat vegetables. Now, remember, this was a day in which people would take an animal to a priest of one of the pagan religions and offer it as a sacrifice. If the priest had more than he and other members of his religious organization could eat, he might have sold it to a butcher in the marketplace. So when you went to the meat market to buy a cut of meat, you wouldn't know whether the meat you bought was once a part of a pagan sacrifice offered to a false god or an idol. In Exodus chapter 34, verse 15, it seems pretty clear that the children of Israel were not to eat meat offered to idols. And didn't Daniel refuse the meat the king served him? What if he didn't know where the meat came from? In Leviticus and Numbers, we read about sins of ignorance. So ignorance was no excuse. If this bothered you, and you believed in your heart that God would be displeased with you if you ate meat that had once been offered to an idol, and you can't tell what meat had and what meat hadn't been offered to an idol, wouldn't the safest thing for you to do would be not to eat meat at all? And shouldn't every other believer feel the same way as you do? And so it was with some of the members of the church in Rome. How does Paul say the stronger believer is to treat the weaker believer? Don't look down on the weaker brother or sister. For the most part, the Gentiles couldn't have cared less about where their meat came from. Growing up before they came to Christ, they never worried about whether or not their roast beef had been offered to an idol. So why should they worry now? And, and why should their Jewish brethren care since they've been free from whatever dietary laws they had previously followed? By the way, Paul answers this question more fully in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 20 through 32 by saying that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So you can eat anything you want unless you are eating in the presence of someone whose faith would be hindered by your eating. But that's another lesson for another time. Here, Paul says the weaker brother or sister shouldn't condemn the person who eats everything without worrying about where it came from or because he doesn't share the same concerns as you do. It's your conscience that leads you not to eat meat. But the other person's uh, conscience doesn't, sh doesn't share the same conviction. Why are we not to criticize the one who eats whatever he wants or the one who only eats vegetables? Because God has accepted us both, regardless of our opinions about what we can or can't eat. 
God has adopted both of us as his beloved children without imposing on, on us a list of do's and don'ts. It's all about living the transformed life of the first two verses of chapter 12. If God has accepted us, as Paul says in verse 3, we ought to accept the one whose faith is weak in the same way God has accepted us. After all, it wasn't eating or not eating that made us righteous. It was faith in Christ and His sacrifice for, for us and that alone. Then Paul asks, who are you to judge someone else's servant? The word to judge is a strong word meaning to condemn. And some of your Bible translations have that word. The Jews who refused to eat meat because it might have been offered to an idol judged those Gentiles who did as guilty of violating the law of God. In turn, the Gentiles despised the Jews who still held fast to their outdated dietary rules. Even though both the one who looked down on others and the one who judged others thought they were serving God, but they were both wrong. God never made it their job to look down on or judge another for these things. So Paul asks, who are you to judge someone else's servant? Whom do we serve? God alone. To whom are we ultimately accountable? To God alone. To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. He does not stand on his own ability or righteousness. We are neither accepted nor not accepted by our eating or not eating, because it's not eating or not eating that gives us our right standing before God. But there's a second example that Paul speaks of in verses 5 through 8. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not, for the Lord he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Here again, there were Christians in the church in Rome who had come to Christ from a Jewish background, and for generations... They had observed festival and feast days and certain Sabbaths as days of formal worship. And they carried those ideas and traditions into their new lives as followers of Christ. They hadn't yet come to the point where they understood the purpose of all those special days was to point to Christ. And they all saw, or at least some of them saw, these things as being a necessary part of their life and worship. On the other hand... There were Gentiles who didn't grow up with those Jewish customs or expectations. On the other, they might have had their own set of special lucky or unlucky or even holy days. And they also might have brought those traditions and customs into their Christian faith. But Paul has already recognized the holiness of every day as we are to continually offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. And the writer of the letter to the Hebrews explains in the first 11 verses of chapter 4 that there is a Sabbath rest for those who have ceased from their own works just as God rested from His. And that's not limited to a day or an hour. What's the answer? Paul says, each person should be fully convinced in his own mind. We should all seek to resolve the doubt and uncertainty that keep us weak in faith, so that we eliminate all the disputable matters that Paul began this chapter with. Now, he doesn't mean that we should pick one side or the other and jump on it with both feet, standing firm in that conviction. We are to become fully convinced. Not because we've decided this is the way it's going to be, but because we've prayed about the issue, we've sought the biblical principles that have a bearing on this matter, we've been honest with ourselves about our past and our prejudices, and we've allowed God to reveal to us His truth and fully persuade us about how we should think and act in relation to this matter. Even so, if a brother or sister comes, a brother and sister in Christ comes to a different conclusion, 
we are to accept him or her just as God accepted us. Because we for sure don't know everything. We could be mistaken about what we believe about this issue. You know, sometimes a little humility goes a long way. So Paul says, however you regard days or meat, or we could add any other issue of life apart from the salvation, do so to the Lord and give thanks to Him. If you think doing a certain thing honors God by your doing it, give thanks to God. If you think not doing something honors God by your not doing it, give thanks to God. If you can't thank God for what you do or you don't do, it may be that you should be doing something different. And don't point your finger judgmentally at the person who doesn't do the, the, the things the same way you do them because the other person is not ultimately accountable to you. God has shown you a different way, perhaps to lovingly and graciously bring that other person to the same conclusion that you've come to. In verse 22, Paul instructs his readers to keep these things that cause disagreements among believers between themselves and God, and to remember that everything we do ought to flow from a life of faith. Because, after all, we're in this together. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. Where there is evidence of faith and a sincere desire to do the will of God, there should also be evidence of genuine love, respect, and mutual care, even though there may be a difference of opinion in smaller matters. Paul reminds us that no true Christian lives to gratify his or her own desires or inclinations. Instead, true believers offer themselves as living sacrifices and allow their minds to be transformed while refusing to be conformed to the pattern of this, of this world so they can see and show what God's perfect will is. And that happens when we set aside our own opinions, our own prejudices, our own expectations, our own demands, and clothe, our, clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and not think about how we can indulge the desires of our sinful nature, as Paul told us in the closing verses of chapter 13. As one commentator says, to live to ourselves is, an evident, is, is evidence that we are strangers to piety. And if it be the great motive of our lives to live at ease, to gratify the flesh, to gain property, or to be distinguished in places of fashion and amusement, it is evidence that we know nothing of the power of that gospel that teaches us to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily. Sometimes, those of us who ought to be the strongest in our faith are actually the weak ones. And the weakness of our faith is seen in our inability to trust God in the midst of change. We, are see, we see ourselves getting older. We see the world changing around us and we don't like what we see. But rather than investing ourselves in helping others discover God's plan and purpose, we resist change and we criticize those who are trying to bring their faith to bear in a changing world. We would rather have things be the way they were instead of trusting God for His vision for the future and joining with Him in what He's doing today. And there are so many other ways that we can apply Paul's words of acceptance here. We should never forget that we're all an essential part of the body of Christ. Each one of us can learn from the other. Each one of us can show love to the other. Besides, we have this great unpayable debt of love we owe to one another. That debt that he talked about in the previous chapter and verse 8. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. Whatever your background, Jew or Gentile, rich or poor, young or old, male or female, black or white, living on this side of the tracks or the other, other side of the tracks, a member of First Church or a House Church, from Tallahassee or Timbuktu, if you're a believer, you live to the Lord and you don't look down on or condemn those believers who live their faith a little different from you. And if you live to the Lord, you also 
die to the Lord. If you're alive to the Lord, you've died to everything else, as Paul explained so well in chapter 6. If we die, we die to the Lord. In both aspects of our existence, life and death, we belong to Him. In everything, we are His, and our purpose is determined by His design and His desire for us. As a result, we're responsible to Him, and we find our freedom in Him. The same goes for every other believer. And we're not somewhere in between them and God. This freedom of conscience is one of the most important of Baptist teachings. In fact, the First Amendment to our Constitution was, to a great degree, the direct result of the work of Baptists. But that's another great story for another day. Commenting on this passage, the great British pastor Charles Spurgeon wrote, Why do you set it not, your brother? You have called the weak one superstitious, but he's your brother. You have called the strong man licentious because he enjoys his liberty, but he's your brother. Are not all believers one family in Christ? Wherever the root of the matter is to be found, there exists an overwhelming argument for undying unity. Far be it from us to find flaws where they do not exist. Max Lucado wrote an amazing and beautiful word picture that compares the church and its members with a ship and its crew. It's called the Fellowship. And you can find it in his book, In the Grip of Grace, chapter 16. And if you'd like to hear it, I'll read it at the conclusion of our lesson today. So far in our text, Paul has instructed the members of the church in Rome and us to accept those whose faith is weak without passing judgment on them for things that reflect their weak faith. He's given us two examples from the church in Rome and probably elsewhere, and he's given two reasons why we shouldn't criticize or condemn those whose faith is weak or their beliefs are different. We are not their masters. God is. And each person belongs to the Lord in both life and death if they live by faith. In verses 9 through 12, Paul expands on this last reason and gives us a very strong warning. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord both of the living, both of the dead and of the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. What was the very reason for Jesus' death and resurrection? So that we would belong to the Lord and he would be Lord of both the dead and the living. Paul doesn't say this was the only purpose in Jesus' death and resurrection, but it was the main purpose that he might redeem us from our sin and claim us as his own. The word for Lord here certainly means one who rules over others, but it also includes the idea of being owner as well. Surely, if we've truly committed our lives to Christ, He both rules our lives and owns our lives. He died and returned to life to be the Lord of the dead. Those who die, having placed their trust in Jesus Christ, are still under the loving care of our Savior Jesus. We are safe in Him even when we depart from this life. Lord of the dead and Lord of the living. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, Paul wrote, You are not your own. You are bought with a price. And it repeats this in chapter 7, verse 23. That price, of course, was the blood of Jesus Christ. His life given for you and me as He took upon Himself the eternal punishment for our sin. Since He has ransomed us by His blood, we belong to Him. And He, in a very real sense, owns us. By His death and resurrection, Jesus established His absolute rule over the grave. He won the victory over death. He defeated Satan so that His rule extends unchallenged over everything in existence. John records Jesus' own words in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18 where He says, I hold the keys of death 
and Hades. With all this in mind, Paul asks, Why do you judge your brother? Or, why do you look down on your brother? First, he asks the Jewish convert why he would judge a fellow believer in Christ since we are equally servants of God. What right does the Jewish convert have to sit in judgment over another? To the Gentile, he asks, why would you look down on your brother? You both are standing on level ground, and one is not higher than the other in any way. How could you despise or ridicule your brother convert from Judaism just because he is unnecessarily careful to obey laws that don't contribute to salvation? If God is the sole owner and sole ruler over everything in creation, why would you even consider placing yourself in, in God's place to judge others? We've all been bought with the same blood, and we're all going to the same heaven, where all these things that, we're so, that we were so concerned about here won't make any difference. And we'll find out then that they never really made a difference to begin with here. Not only do we stand equally before God now, we will all stand before God one day to give an account of our lives. There, we will answer, not to other believers, but to God for what we've done. So there's no reason for us to pass judgment on one another now. To underscore this, Paul quotes what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 23. In that day when we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, each of us will give an account of ourselves to the Lord. Paul writes to the Corinthians about this same judgment in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. And this is the image that Paul wanted his readers to picture in their minds. The winner of an Olympic game in that day was led to the judge of the competition who sat on a platform called the judgment seat, which is the exact same word that Paul uses here. And the judge placed a wreath made from laurel leaves on the winner's head as a symbol of victory. So Paul pictures the believer as not just a competitor, but a winner in a spiritual contest. Just as the victorious athlete appeared before the judgment seat to receive his perishable award, so the Christian will appear before Christ's judgment seat to receive his imperishable award. It's important to note here that only rewards were given out at the judgment seat, not punishments. In that moment when Christ returns, our lives will be evaluated. You and I will give an account of what we've done and why we've done it, what we've done with God is entrusted to us. Every thought, every action, every opportunity will be examined to determine what eternal value it had. We won't be judged on the basis of sin, but on the basis of stewardship, what we've done with what God has entrusted to us. The judgment is His and His alone. Since this life is nothing more than a prelude to eternal life, since this life is the moment we have to prepare ourselves for the eternity that lies before us, how should we live? Particularly in our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now in the remainder of chapter 13, Paul continues to provide instructions about how we are to treat one another in matters of disagreement. And I would encourage you to read and study it for yourself. Perhaps the bottom line of his message in this chapter is found in verse 19, where he says, Let us there make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification, building one another up. In our own day, there are certainly examples of disagreements within Christianity that are as troublesome as eating or not drink, eating, or observing or not observing certain days. Let me encourage you to apply Paul's message from Romans chapter 13 to those matters where you could make a positive influence to bring peace and help build others up in their faith. Next Sunday, we come to the table one last time with a lot of, an, a lot of elephants still left on the table as we conclude our all too brief study of Paul's letter to the Christians in Rome as we turn to chapter 15 and consider some of Paul's closing words to this beloved church.
Thank you for being part of this study of the Word of God. May the Lord bless you as you feast on His Word today and throughout the week to come, and as you seek to build others up so that they might enjoy the fullness of their freedom in Christ. Even as we continue to pray that we'll be back in Sunday school soon. In the meantime, as Brother Derek has reminded us, keep calm and wash your hands. God bless you. And now, for those of you who would like to hear Max Lucado's wonderful word picture about the church, here it is. Again, it comes from chapter 16 of his book, In the Grip of Grace. To live above with those we love, oh, how that will be glory. To live below with those we know, now that's another story. Best I can figure, the situation reads something like this. God has enlisted us in His Navy and placed us on His ship. The boat has one purpose, to carry us safely to the other shore. This is no cruise ship, it's a battleship. We aren't called to a life of leisure, we're called to a life of service. Each of us has a different task. Some, concerned with those who are drowning, are snatching people from the water. Others are occupied with the enemy, so they man the canons of prayer and worship. Still others devote themselves to the crew, feeding and training the crew members. Though different, we're all the same. Each can tell of a personal encounter with a captain, for each has received a personal call. He has found us among the shanties of the seaport and invited us to follow him. Our faith was born at the sight of his fondness, and so we went. We each followed him across the gangplank of his grace onto the same boat. There is one captain and one destination. Though the battle is fierce, the boat is safe, for our captain is God. This ship will not sink, for that there is no concern. There is concern, however, regarding the harmony of the crew. When we first boarded, we assumed that the crew was made up of others just like us. But as we've wandered these decks, we've encountered curious converts with curious appearances. Some wear uniforms we've never seen, sporting styles we've never witnessed. Why do you look the way you do? We asked them. Funny, they replied. We were about to ask the same of you. The variety of dress is not disturbing as the diversity of opinion. There is a group, for example, who clusters every morning for serious study. They promote rigid discipline and somber expressions. Serving the captain is serious business, they explain. It's no co coincidence that they tend to congregate in that part of the boat called the stern. There's another regiment deeply devoted to prayer. Not only do they believe in prayer, they believe in prayer by kneeling. And for this reason, you always know where to locate them. They are at the bow of the ship. And then there are a few who staunchly believe real wine should be used in the Lord's Supper. And you'll find them on the port side. Still another group has positioned themselves near the engine. They spend hours examining the nuts and bolts of the boat. They've been known to go below deck and not come up for days. They're occasionally criticized by those who linger on the top of the deck, feeling the wind in their hair and the sun on their face. It's not what you learn, those topside argue. It's what you feel that matters. And oh, how we tend to cluster. Some think that once you're on the boat, you can't get off. Others say you'd be foolish to go overboard, but the choice is yours. Some believe you volunteer for service. Others believe you are destined for the service before the ship was even built. Some predict a storm of great tribulation will strike before we dock. Others say it won't hit until we are safely ashore. There are those who speak to the captain in a personal language. And then there are those who think that such languages no longer exist. There are those who think the officers should wear robes. There are those who think there should be no, officer, no officers at all. And there are those who think we're all officers and we should all wear robes. And oh, how we tend to cluster. And then there's the issue of the weekly meetings at which the captain is thanked and his words are read. All agree on its importance, but few agree on its nature. Some want it loud, Others quiet, somewhat rituals, others spontaneity. 
Someone to celebrate so they can meditate. Others meditate so they can celebrate. Some want a meeting for those who've gone overboard. Others want to reach those overboard, but without going overboard and neglecting those on board. And oh, how we tend to cluster. The consequence is a rocky boat. There is trouble on deck. Fights have broken out. Sailors have refused to speak to each other. There have even been times when one group refused to acknowledge the very presence of others on the ship. Most tragically, some adrift at sea have chosen not to board the boat because of the quarreling of the sailors. What do we do? We'd like to ask the captain. How can there be harmony on the ship? We don't have to go far to find the answer. On the last night of his life, Jesus prayed a prayer that stands as a citadel for, for all Christians. I pray for these followers, but I am also praying for all those who will believe in me because of their teaching. Father, I pray that they can be one. As you are in me and I am in you, I pray that they can also be one in us. Then the world will believe that you sent me. John 17, verse 20. How precious are these words. Jesus, knowing the end is near, prays one final time for his followers. Striking, isn't it? That he prayed not for their success, their safety, or their happiness. He prayed for their unity. He prayed that they would love each other. As he prayed for them, he also prayed for those who will believe because of their teaching. That means us. In his last prayer, Jesus prayed that you and I would be one. Of all the lessons we can draw from this verse, don't miss the most important. Unity matters to God. The Father does not want His kids to squabble. Disunity disturbs Him. Why? Because all people will know that you are my followers if you love each other. John chapter 13, verse 35. Unity creates belief. How will the world believe that Jesus was sent by God? Not if we agree with each other. Not if we solve every controversy. Not if we are unanimous on every vote. Not if we never make a doctrinal error. But only if we love one another. Unity creates belief. Disunity fosters disbelief. Who wants to board a ship of bickering sailors? Life on the ocean may be rough, but at least the waves don't call us names. Thank you, Max Licato. May you seek unity and build others up in your walk of faith this week.